So um, we make our technology available through a couple of different mechanisms. Um, first, through Google products, because we have this sister company relationship with, with Google. Um, also, the part of uh, Google DeepMind that I work in is called Google DeepMind Institute. And our area is specifically devoted to working with third parties, um, like NGOs, nonprofits, um, and trying to solve global challenges. So we give our technology open access to these groups um, and really try to solve challenges in a responsible way to communities that might have less access traditionally to those you know, high tech solutions. Please welcome to the stage Sims Witherspoon, Climate and Sustainability Lead at Google DeepMind with Bloomberg's Jackie Davalos and Nate Langson. Like we never left. It's like we never went anywhere. Hello. Um, so the clip that you have just seen is a very special treat. That is an upcoming clip from an episode of the Bloomberg, Bloomberg Originals show that Jackie and I co-host AI IRL, now in its second season. Very, very happy about that. And the conversation that we had on that episode that's going to come out next month was with Sims, who is joining us today because she was so interesting. We thought, well, <laughs> let's do this actually IRL in real life uh, on a stage here. So it's amazing that we've got you here. Now, before we jump into what we want to talk about, we do have a poll, which hopefully you guys have been doing plenty of and we can get up on screen. The question we wanted to ask is, do you think AI will help or hinder humanity's effort to tackle climate change? You have a range of options. I'm hoping you don't choose the middle one because that's boring. Um, <laughs> definitely help, maybe help in the future. Not convinced either way. You can you can see those. Please please vote. And it was interesting because I think it was in the first the first poll, right? They said what, where AI can make the most impact, and it was healthcare. But you've already heard about some of the exciting things going on in clean tech, so perhaps the audience might be a little bit more optimistic. Yeah, that's my that's my hope. I can't see them because the lights are so bright. Eventually, but you, but they you will seem, have to. the ones in the front look pretty optimistic. Um, so we're going to get some results in. Um, and then we'll make a comment about them. Here we go. Excellent. Right, that's dream scenario <laughs> A, Jackie, dream scenario A. Um, fantastic, well, let's get on. This is a chat show. Let's Amazing. chat. Okay, well, let's take a step back because a lot of people know Google's DeepMind as the company that developed a system to beat the board game Go. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain how DeepMind went from doing that to climate science? Yeah, of course. So um, Go was really, AlphaGo was a system that we developed um, that hopefully folks are familiar with. But um, games are a really interesting place to test AI because they have very clear goals, success metrics, um, clear benchmarks, and, the, and lots of data. And so that's the kind of system that is really interesting for AI because it's a perfect test bed. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting about AlphaGo is that even though it's a game we've been playing for hundreds of years, using an AI system actually taught us new information that we didn't know about the game before. And um, we've really expanded um, this idea into other systems like AlphaFold, for instance. Um, AlphaFold is a system that um, takes in amino acid sequences and tells us how proteins are folded. Um, we a, a developed a database that basically works like Google search for proteins. Um, and we were able to give that to the research community in order to further their research. So if you look at kind of the development of, of uh, systems like AlphaFold, you can see that some of the scientists that might use that would understand proteins, for instance, if they're engineering enzymes. Um, we actually do work with a partner who is looking into enzymes that biodegrade plastics and are able to do their work more quickly because they have access to the library that AlphaFold provides. DeepMind CEO is a big Atari fan, so more yeah. of the stories, <laughs> let your kids play video games. I mean, the answer to how do you go from AlphaGo to climate science is, well, you just go via, you know, 200 million proteins, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, which is, which, is, which is great. So, you know, in the episode that you are in next month, we, we take a very global view, because it's a global show, but we're here in the UK uh, with our fantastic climate and weather, you know, it's lovely today. Um, <laughs> so can you tell us about something you've done here? 
um, that that you've been that you've seen and that is going to excite everybody? Yeah, we we'll talk about the weather um, yeah. since the UK loves talking about especially rainfall. So maybe I'll go with that example. Um, we did a partnership with the Met Office, um, particularly working with some of their expert meteorologists looking at heavy rainfall because heavy rainfall um, is what causes damage to people and property. And so we developed a system that was a generative AI system. So effectively, you can think about it. You know, when you look at the weather and you see those, you know, beautiful pictures on screen with lots of colors of like where where rain is going to happen, like where it's going to be heavy, where it's going to be light, how it's going to move throughout the UK. Um, and we basically fed that radar data to our system, um, and it watched it like a movie, effectively, and predicted the next frame. So we were able to. This is something we call precipitation now casting. Um, so it's the forecasting for two hours hours ahead of time, so very short term for forecasting. And we worked with the Met Office to do this. They were an incredible partner because um, actually 99% of the country here in the UK is covered by the radar data we needed in order to build these systems. If you compare that to the country where I'm from, the United States, only 73% of the contigu contiguous United States is covered by that same data. So um, it was very, it was much easier for us to work here with the Met Office and also a partner who is willing to contribute all of their domain expertise uh, to working with our machine learning researchers. I mean, weather forecasting as well has got so much further than when I was a kid and I used to pretend I was ill to get out of school. <laughs> like Michael Fish floating on a virtual UK outside of ITV's headquarters. I don't know if anyone remembers that. It's like the most bizarre approach to talking These about the weather. Over, Nate. <laughs> I know, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that data. How do you get companies to give up that data? Do you have to persuade them to install sensors or some other kind of equipment? How does that kind of partnership work? That's a really good question. So it varies um, by the type of problem we're working on. But the main way that we work on data accessibility with partners is really just trust. Um, so we go in and we talk about uh, the problems that they have and the problems that they're trying to solve, um, what the solutions need to look like, and how they're going to use them. Because without those sorts of partnerships and without that conversation, we might be building something that doesn't get used. And that's not the point, especially when you're talking about climate and sustainability applications. Um, so the trust is, I think, the biggest part of that. And once you figure out, um, once you build the relationship and you decide on a problem you're going to sort out together, um, you can see what pieces of information need to feed into that. So if we think about the MET partnership, the things we needed to um, you know, do that project were radar data, which um, the MET delivers through its data licensing um, process at every five minutes on a feed that gives you one kilometer resolution. And, and the metric they use for the data is um, moist, atmospheric moisture um, one millimeter per hour. So it's all of the data we really needed. Um, and when we built that partnership, we were able to understand that with them and get access to it through their processes. So, Would you, Jackie, would you trust DeepMind to put sensors on your building? <laughs> You know, if they can be that exact, and if I know exactly how it's being used, maybe not. You know, maybe, maybe so. I yeah. think it just kind of depends, like you said, on the trust and um, where, you know, some of the trust has been before in a company like DeepMind, given you guys already have made such strides, especially with, like, out, you know, protein folding prediction. Um, I'd love to see what you guys do in the climate space. Well, I want to talk a little bit about surprises, because I love a surprise. Um, you know, and I have seen someone jump out of a cake once, which was... Oh, wow. That was, a, that was a surprise for everyone. They didn't know I was going to do that. Um, <laughs> so, so you must come up, you must see surprises a lot. You've talked about the Met Office, obviously. Um, you work with academics, you work with companies and partners, and I'm kind of curious to get a sense of the kind of surprises that you stumble upon. And if I can give you an example of my favorite surprise that I know yeah. happened at DeepMind, it was this Move 37. Uh, in, in AlphaGo, you yeah. know, it's well worth looking up. There's probably an entire article about this one move because it was this move in the game that realistically no human would ever have made because it was nuts, it was crazy. But it was like this first moment where we thought, ah, it's doing something, but the creators didn't know. Like, like we didn't expect that. Yeah. You know, like jumping out of a cake at someone's wedding. Like, they didn't know that was going <laughs> to happen. So does that kind of thing happen in in your side of the fence in climate as well? Absolutely. Um, that's that piece of new knowledge where AI systems can teach us things that we didn't know before. I'll never forget one of the first projects I was working on with DeepMind. Um, it was an industrial optimization project, and we were trying to help a really, really large facility uh, reduce the energy that was required for cooling it. And in this facility, the cooling was run by like these 
three massive chillers. I mean, we're talking about chillers the size of school buses. Do they have those here in the UK? We have schools here. Okay, so, no, school buses. School buses. <laughs> um, and they're like, they're, so they're, they're massive. And the way that they'd always run them um, is that they would start one of the massive chillers, run it to max capacity when they needed a second, turn that one on, run it to max, and so on and so forth. And uh, when we started running our AI system, you know, the moment we kind of turned it on, so to speak, the very first recommendation it delivered was turn off all the chillers. <laughs> and we kind of looked around at each other and we were like, oh, that sounds a little sketchy, but we, we do trust the system. So, you know, what do you think? Because you turn to your partners at that point. Um, I mentioned the domain experts we work with. In this instance, they were the facility managers. And we were like, you know, ultimately up to you all, what do you think? And I remember she looked around and she was like, let's do it. So we turned off all the chillers. The very next recommendation of the AI system was to turn all of the chillers on at the lowest capacity possible. So what it had effectively learned through the um, sensor information across the industrial system was it was actually much more efficient to turn every single one of those industrial size chillers on at low capacity than it was to turn one on at a time, max it out. And that was a new piece of information. They had never tried that before. We all, including the domain experts, were looking around at each other like, mm, is this a good idea. Um, but ultimately, it was a new piece of information that they then continued to use. So that was definitely a surprise. Well, we were nervous. Speaking of those chillers, AI is also known to be quite energy intensive. Could you maybe talk about what the net impact of the technology that DeepMind is developing in the climate space, what that can actually be, and how you're kind of measuring success along the way? Yeah, so how, how we measure success for the projects I work on, again, it's very um, project dependent. So you work with domain experts to figure out how they measure success and their problems. Um, the problems that I'm specifically working on right now involve climate change mitigation. So we measure that very much by uh, CO2E, so carbon equivalents, and the reduction that we can get in CO2E um, emissions. And so, but the metric will change depending on your project. I think that if I, if I step back and I think about your overall uh, question around how do we at Google DeepMind think about the environmental impact of AI, um, we really do three, kind of three things. The first thing is that we make sure our house is in order, so to speak. You know, we look at our carbon footprint, we look how to run our experiments as carbon efficiently as possible. Um, we also then, the second thing is we develop products that help other people with their energy efficiency. Um, and the third thing is that we are working on breakthrough technologies that we hope will accelerate our transition to net zero. Because ultimately, you know, any carbon intensive technology, AI included, will have a carbon footprint, or any energy intensive technology, sorry, any energy intensive technology will have a carbon footprint until the grid is run on carbon free energy. And that's just a fact. So we kind of have to do all three of those components to work towards that eventual outcome. He, you, I mean, you were saying something backstage about you know being able to deploy an AI process onto a green grid oh, yeah. at Google. Like, how does that work? Yeah, so one of the really interesting models that Google has developed um, for their own compute is that uh, the compute that can wait, so that doesn't need to be immediately um, sent to production, um, can kind of get they gets put in a queue and you can move it in space and time to where the greenest grids are. So let's just say for whatever reason, the UK was really carbon intensive when I wanted to run my experiment. I could just choose to run it an hour later in Norway where the, green was, the grid was very green. Um, so I think that, that system is so cool and a really interesting use of AI for sustainability. So, I mean, we're talking about um, making a difference, but how, I mean, how, do you, how do you know when to move on? You know, I don't want to say failure, you'll probably call it sunsetting <laughs> a project, but I mean, I, PR speak. Yeah, I mean, I learned some of my best lessons through failing. Yeah. I, I refer you to the cake example. Uh, so like, how do you know when to say this is, this isn't, this isn't working? Well, let's move on. Yeah. So Google DeepMind is a science organization. And so, um, we're an R and D company at heart. And I think that the way we think about failures are really about learnings. And the scientific process is incredibly iterative. So if we you know, plan out a piece of research and we have these things called milestones where we expect to achieve certain bits of research or certain bits of progress, um, we kind of check in at those points and we say, hey, are, are our hypotheses still true? 
you know, are, are we still working towards the direction that will create positive impact? If not, how do we shift and pivot or how do we get around obstacles? So you might call that, you know, failure mode or sunsetting an idea, but I think for us, it's really about how we pivot research, how we come at it at another angle, how we approach it with maybe a new AI architecture, um, and so how we adjust and iterate as we move forward. Um, and we, we do those by checking in at those regular milestones and just having really honest conversations with ourselves and with lots of different experts around the table. Take us into the DeepMind lab. When you are kind of creating this climate uh, technology, what are you guys doing back there? I mean, how much different is it now incorporating all of these new AI tools that wasn't necessarily possible before? This is what we call the, can you take us into the day in the life of Sims with a spoon, please? <laughs> and how much of it is spent in a lab coat? Because in my oh, yeah. head, it's a lot of people in lab coats looking at computer screens going. Yeah, someone mentioned um, that AI isn't just for the nerds anymore. I think it was the Anthropic uh, founder. So what does it look like for you? Uh, well, they made me take my lab coat off and brush my hair as soon as I walked in the door downstairs. But um, aside from that, um, <laughs> no, it is, you know, it's really, it's, a, it's an incredibly interesting place to work. I think that, you know, people assume that it's full of, you know, only scientists. But um, the fact of the matter is, is we do have research scientists. We have scientists like myself who were trained in different domains that were not machine learning, who are now doing, you know, product um, type jobs. We have communications experts and policy specialists and ethicists and, you know, responsibility folks. And so it really is a lot of different um, individuals with a variety of skill sets and a diversity of backgrounds. Um, and I would say that, you know, if you're walking down the corridors of Google DeepMind, it is absolutely true that you pass loads of whiteboards uh, and people huddle around the whiteboards and marking things up in different colors and um, you know, kind of debating different ideas. And I haven't been to the office today, so I don't have any whiteboard marker marks on my hands yet. But um, that absolutely is true. Um, I think to your question, Jackie, around how we're going about you know, creating this technology, one of the things that we do is we use this triage process where we look at all of the things that will have Globe, what we believe is global impact on uh, climate change mitigation or adaptation or addressing loss and damage. And then we look at the subsection of things that ML can really affect because you know, climate change is an economic problem, it's a socio-political issue, it's a science and technology problem, but you know, ML is not the right tool for all of those areas, right? It is a very powerful tool for a very specific set of problems. Um, and so we then dive into where ML can really help. Um, and I know in the, in the episode we talked about kind of this three-part framework, but maybe I'll just leave Spoiler. that as a teaser. Spoiler. Yeah, I know, it's Spoiler. a teaser. <laughs> Well, on that note, um, I'm, I'm a little curious about, you know, all of these technologies being developed, who gets access to them? You mentioned that you came at office, but, you know, there's also a commercial component to this, but you guys also have partnerships where you don't charge for some of this technology. Can yeah. you kind of walk us through how you make that decision? Yeah, so um, it depends, it's, again, it's, we make the decision um, tech by tech, kind of application by application. Um, and so, for instance, we were talking about AlphaFold earlier. We thought that it was incredibly important because we just don't have the capacity to take those 200 million proteins and actually do all of the research ourselves. So we thought it was really important to release that database to researchers across health sciences, climate, et cetera. Um, and so the academic community has free and open access to the database. Um, but at the same time, we also, for you know, drug discovery and things like this, where you might be working with Big Pharma, for instance, we've spun off a company called Isomorphic Labs. Demis is also the CEO of that, um, where we will be able to have you know, the commercialization of that technology as well. Um, so it's really a case-by-case -case basis. I think for, for climate tech, um, my team, our ultimate goal is always to open source, you know, where it's safe and responsible to do so. It's not always the case. Um, but we, we kind of assume that is our end goal and we work directly from there. So any of the partners that we, um, we agree to work with, we say, hey, we ultimately want to make this what, widely available. We want to be able to develop generalized architectures that we can share. So when we work with you, we're going to take those learnings and you know, build something that's generalizable. Um, and then obviously, you know, they own the models that are trained on their data, so that's all kept you know, um, behind that security wall. Um, and then we just we move on to our additional applications. Well, you mentioned the S word then, safety. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've got this UK AI safety summit 
coming up. Coming up in like a week at Bletchley yeah. Park. Um, big focus is that on, is on safety. I don't know if you're going, but I mean, what, what would you hope that people then at going to that would actually be talking about with, as it relates to your field? Yeah, I think that, you know, with climate sustainability, as well as like the rest of AI, we're really just scratching the surface of what our potential is with this technology. And so I think the Safety Summit is a really wonderful opportunity for folks and experts, you know, in from various fields to share the potentials, but also the risks of the technology and just have a really open conversation about what that is and what we need to be able to do about it. Okay. Um, is this something, just because we've got the last minute here, yeah. like, is this something that, um, you think people here either don't know, but really should, or something they probably do know, but actually things have changed quite a bit. Oh. Don't know, but really should. Um, I think that the, the first thing that comes to mind when I hear that is the data piece. So AI is not a plug and play technology. You know, we start working with partners and, we, and they say, oh, we want AI to fix all these different problems. And when we start looking at the data, we actually realize there's a lot of legwork that needs to be done to get something kind of AI ready. So I think something that people don't know but should is that as soon as you decide that you want an AI application to solve a challenge that you have related to climate and sustainability or really anything else, look at the data you have that you'll need in order to solve that problem and make sure it is clean. And by that, we mean it's accurate, it's unbiased, it's actually representative of the problem. Um, because sometimes that legwork can take months or even like a year, um, and you have to do it before you're working with AI systems. Um, I think something that people know, but I don't know about should forget, but I think how about know but forget is that AI is not a silver bullet. Like, it will not fix all problems related to climate change. I mentioned earlier, it's not even the right tool for the, lot of the challenges we face um, in this space. But it is a really powerful tool that, if we are able to wield it effectively, will have transformative impact for climate sustainability. So I'm really excited about it. And I'm really glad everyone on the poll is as well. So, so. optimistic. Yeah. yeah. And just as a reminder, it was it was scenario A, which is things are good. Yeah. So that's, so that's good. Well, look, we're, we're out of time. In fact, we're over by 56 seconds. So I'm going to get a beating in a little bit. But thank you. <laughs> this has been amazing. I should remind everyone that if you did like this, including the look and the people, then in a month's <laughs> time, uh, Simpsons episode of AI IRL will be airing. Go and follow Bloomberg Originals. Follow wherever you follow your things and you'll, you'll see it. Um, but uh, Sims, it's been fantastic thank you for, for joining to have us you on. Again. Thank, thank you so much for having me. It's such a treat to see you all. Thank you. Um, and lunch is now.